Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that was like a vicar. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Welcome, welcome, <laughs> welcome to Kendall Book Festival and Kendall Mountain Festival. Uh, my name is Jamie. I instinctively asked if I could join this session on the strength of just one line shared online by our guest today, Noreen Masood. She shared a line on social media to announce her joining the festival and said, don't take the piss, I'm going to a mountain festival. <laughs> and on that line alone, I thought, I want to meet Noreen. Um, thrilled, as always, for the sponsorship of Cotswold Outdoor, um, a tremendous sponsor that gives to a number of charities. Um, before we move on, just to mention the very simple reason that we're here is obviously Noreen and this wonderful book, A Flat Place. The book will be on sale after this event, just to the back corner of the room, and there will be certainly times, and must be times, for questions and answers before we get to there. But just before we start officially, I know that Noreen would just like to say something, please, if we could have your attention. Thank you. First of all, thank you all so much for coming. I'm really delighted and confused to see so many of you here at 9.15 on a Sunday morning. <laughs> this is not what I expected. Um, just as Jamie said, wanted to start by saying a few words. Um, more than anything else, this is a book about the value of brown lives, the value of the lives of people of colour, and the rights of people of colour to be full human beings, um, not just to live, not just to survive, but to have ridiculous attachments to place, to have idiosyncrasies, to be joyful but also imperfect, sulky, argumentative, flawed in very human ways, to be full humans, really. Um, and I want to say, therefore, that there can be no acceptable solution to conflict that involves treating brown people as more dispensable than white lives. Um, if we would not say that it is an acceptable sacrifice to bombard Liverpool or London or Edinburgh, it cannot be just to annihilate a city of brown people. And on that note, I have to start by expressing my full solidarity with Gaza and add my voice to those pleading for ceasefire. Thank, thank you, Noreen. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> I knew this was going to be a tricky hour for me because Noreen manages words like a 15-ball juggler, whereas I've never learnt to even use a yo-yo. Um, but move on we must. And the first question I'd like to, to introduce today is really that when reading this book, A Flat Place, I, felt, I found that interwoven with a series of flat places was a sense of underlying and at times overarching trauma, which I began to see not as a catalyst, but perhaps as a constant. And this is something I hope we can try to understand or at least delve into in the short time that we have this morning, and that readers certainly will in the time that they spend with this delicately compelling book. Was it your intention, uh, Noreen, to depict existence rather than flashpoints? Yeah, so um, worth maybe providing a little bit of context. Um, I grew up, I was born and raised in Pakistan to a Pakistani father and a white mother. I came over to the UK about two weeks before my 16th birthday after a life in Pakistan that was strange. Strange for Britain, but also specifically strange for Pakistan. With a strange father with strange rules. Um, and everything should have been better. I thought, once I got to Britain and was free to go where I wanted and study what I liked and live the life that I chose um, as a queer woman. Um, but everything wasn't all right, and I couldn't really understand why, because when I looked back at my life, I couldn't see one event that was the turning point, that was the, the catastrophe, that was the central trauma that explained why I felt so awful all the time. And over time, working with an extremely wise therapist, I came to understand that what had happened to me wasn't a single big event, like a mountain, if you like, in the middle of a plain, but so many tiny things that had happened to me before I even knew what it was for something to happen to you, 
what that meant. That they formed in their, their plenitude a kind of flat landscape where there was nothing to look at, but every inch of it was electric. And so I became very interested in that understanding of time, I guess, that understanding of life. And it offered a way of, to understand why I'd always been obsessed with flat landscapes. I, since I was a tiny child growing up in the hall, seeing extraordinary flat, empty fields on my way to school um, that always mesmerized me. I didn't know why. Um, to understand a bit why flat landscapes were so interesting to me and yet so underexplored and undervalued. Thank you for that, Noreen. That leads me to perhaps a simplistic question, but I, I, don't, I don't think it is. Perhaps it just sounds simple, but I wondered, you, you've already opened up this idea of why flat places attracted you. Yeah. I, I wondered if there was a sense of, with the flatness, came a sense of there's nothing, hopefully, nothing lurking there. Mm. There's, there, there. There's nowhere for danger or risk to hide. And, and I wondered how, how that felt for you and how that, that translated mm. to your feeling of home. Yeah. Um, in a non-flat landscape, there are demands for your attention being made on every side. Look at me, look at this, look at the river, look at... Everything is so beautiful. And there's a kind of implicit demand made on you to soak everything and everything in and really give it the attention and the fullness that it deserves. You know, quickly, make the most of it in this moment. And it's... I can find that quite... I love a mountain, don't get me wrong. Um, and not just because I'm scared you're all going to mob me if I say I don't at a mountain festival. Um, but there is a, I feel a lifting of myself in a flat landscape in a way I feel nowhere else. Because, as you said, Jamie, there's nothing to, there's no, no there's sort of anything predatory that can get you. Um, but also, you are freed to not pay attention, to be with the landscape in a totally different way than the visual, you know? just to feel this sense of space on every side, to experience your body in a new way in the space, there's something very tall and very upright, and to have the freedom to move or do whatever you like. Maybe you want to, I want to lie down in a flat landscape. I want to experiment with the different things that my body wants to do. Um, and I feel like I'm rising into the air. Yeah, it's extraordinary. A flat space is amazing, I think. So the flat space elevates. Yes, And perhaps weirdly. leads elsewhere for you then. Oh yeah. I, I know we would like to hear you read, um, but I'd like to take my uh, kind of, play my Joker card, I guess, and ask if you might read page 73. Yeah. To the top of 74. 73, yeah. Ah, yeah. So this is um, a passage of the book about, about event and how we might we are drawn to event as readers and narrators of our own lives. We think that it can explain things or be act as a kind of event that matters, right? But not all lives turn on huge dramatic events. Um, so this was when my father disowned me when I was two weeks from turning 16. Um, we realized that our aunt and grandmother were there as witnesses to an ultimatum. My aunt was glowing. She could hardly keep still. I'd never seen her so pleased. My father addressed himself to me and Spot, my sister. Rabbit, my older sister, was already dead to him. She'd passed beyond the pale, and it was a good thing she'd already run, made her way alone to the UK. She should count herself lucky, he intimated, to be dead only to him. Equally, it was game over for my mother. She'd betrayed him by bringing us up so badly, by not telling him the secret when she must surely have known. I didn't know, she sobbed into her dupatta. I didn't know, I had no idea. How could you not have known, my father scoffed. Of course you knew. He glanced over at us, then repeated with less certainty but more emphasis. Of course you knew. Forget me not would be spared. She was only 13 and younger than that, really, young and confused enough to still run to hug him when he arrived home for a rest in the middle of the day, with pretty pale skin and hair, almost like a white child, and therefore closer, people thought, without noticing themselves thinking it, closer to being human. So forget-me-not could go with my mother if she wanted, but she'd stay my father's daughter, no matter what. 
that left two of us. And we had to decide to live a good Muslim life, stay home, marry as directed, or to get out. And you'll be dead to me, he said. The unnerving thing in hindsight was realizing how few narrative options he had. How else might this have gone? What a decision it would have been to forgive, to accept the choices that had been made, to resist the rush of anger, to brazen it out. It would have been, in fact, an impossible decision. When the small, soft part of you is touched, you fold unthinkingly around it. I don't believe he'd thought much about what would happen after the thrill of the dramatic gesture subsided. When the chips were down, Apollo was no use to him as a god. Disowning was simply the most convenient response that he found to hand, despite all his past scorn for conservative Pakistani ways, the moment that his omnipotence was threatened. The formula was a familiar one. It gave him a part to perform. He'd ended up playing the strong father and couldn't quite believe it, I think, when we called his bluff, when we chose to be dead. It struck me on reading that I was about a third of the way through the book. So this wasn't presented as the, the reason for the book necessarily, or the turning point. It's not a climactic point, um, nor, nor perhaps revelation. Um, it, it's arrived without fanfare or warning, um, not as a cliffhanger, not as dilemma. It just is. Is that how it felt, just one thing yeah. after another? Totally. And one of the things I always want to say when I talk about this moment in my life that in many ways frames itself as a turning point, right? A big thing happened. Uh, my father disowned me. I moved to the UK. On paper, it's a big change, right? And when I tell this story, it offers itself up as the mountain of my life, as a thing that should be focused on. Um, the kind of, you know, and if I were trying to work out what was the bad thing that happened, people often say to me, oh, that's so terrible. No wonder you feel bad. Your father disowned you. You had to move country. And I have to say, that, had, that is not the explanation. The, the thing that mattered in my life, the things that, thing that makes me feel empty inside and alienated, is the 15 years before it. That time when nothing happened. That is the thing. That is the... the the landscape of my, the landscape part of my life that I will gaze at forever without understanding it. So this book is all about, I guess, how, partly about how we pay attention to things and urging us not always to focus on the peaks as the points of significance. But so much significance can be rooted in the parts of a landscape or a life that we see as empty or numb or holding nothing of interest. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. It was the, the, the sense that we chose to be dead. And I'm not going to ask you the question, because I'd rather we thought about that, but the question I had was, could it have ever have gone another way, and where might that have led? But I'm going to leave that hanging, if that's OK, because yeah. I think perhaps that's where it should be. And move us instead to an incredible place, one of the flat places in the book, a place some of you may have visited, um, Orford Ness. Uh, Orford Ness featured last year in, in an incredible performance between Hayden Thorpe and uh, Robert McFarlane. Uh, Ness being a peninsula, an unusual piece of land in itself, and Orford being the strangest one of all. So in 2022, you visited Orford. Um, oh, sorry, I, th I did. I think you may have done too. <laughs> Art imitating life. Uh, I've since prefixed Orford Ness as Orford strangeness, mm -hmm. Orford wickedness, Orford awkwardness. Um, it fascinates other writers, uh, writers and artists. Um, can you tell us what you actually found at Orford Ness and what you didn't? I love Orford awkwardness. That's brilliant. <laughs> I might adopt that. Um, so actually, it was a return for me to Orford Ness. Yeah, and I think I think it was, no, 2021. It was that I went. Um, I'd been when I was doing my masters at Cambridge with Rob McFarlane, yes, my tutor, and he took us on a field trip there. And as I talk about in the book, I was very, very depressed when I was at Cambridge, sort of moving through life in a sort of daze. That was, I think it was something about moving to a flat landscape that reminded me of those big fields that used to mesmerize me in Lahore that, that really disorientated me and plunged me back into this sense of confusion 
about what was wrong. Something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what. So anyway, with Rob, we went to Orfordness, and I knew when I went that this landscape would stick with me forever because that was the moment when I realised that flatness has the power to keep you, to keep your attention, to keep your gaze if you allow it to. I hadn't really articulated that before I went. Um, and it was a great privilege to be able to return to Orfordness, sort of, I guess, what would it have been, 10 years later? Um, because flat spaces often vanish. They are too useful. They get built over, they get used for farmland, whatever. We don't like them, but they're useful. So to get to return to one's very special. Actually, when I went on this occasion, I was expecting to have that same sort of experience of being bowled over, because right, it's such an iconic flat, that flat landscape. But what I found actually was something that surprised me. Um, I found myself alienated from it. And the sensation I had on this visit was of a landscape over which so many really compelling stories had been overwritten. Orphanness, of course, you, because there's so much unexploded military ordnance buried in, and hasn't been found yet, it's a sort of ex, sorry, I should have said it's an ex-military testing site, it's one of the places involved in the development of radar and other things we don't know about because some things are still sort of shrouded in secrecy. Um, it's a landscape that is dangerous. You cannot step off the assigned paths. And the Nat National Trust has also sort of given a lot of guidance around the paths. There's lots of signs encouraging you to notice certain things and passing over others. And I got to thinking, walking around that landscape, about paths, about the paths that are made available to us, um, not just in our lives, but as storytellers, right? Um, we have a sense of how a narrative should work, what should happen, um, what the sort of... And if, if, you, if you lose concentration while you're telling a story, it's easy to fall into cliché to fall into the patterns of a story that's already been told hundreds and hundreds of times. And it mirrored the difficulties I was have, having telling my story. Now, as a woman of colour, a brown woman of, of Muslim origin in the UK, there are lots of stories that get told about someone like me who gets disowned by her father and comes to the UK. And all of them are framed as Islam is terrible and the West is a kind of refuge. That wasn't my story. And... It wasn't the story I wanted to tell. And yet, narratively, it's such a familiar one that I kept finding my story falling into those grooves. So Orphanness, in a sense, articulated that dilemma, right? How we tell a totally a story that really hasn't been told before. How we allow newness into our stories. So Orphanness, I felt weirdly constricted because it felt so close to home. Yeah, and that was weird. <laughs> I... Um... In my own experience, I went after a period of seven or eight weeks without any rain whatsoever in the area. And this is already a dry, shingly, bare space, but at its driest, um, saw shriveled bramble and a couple of wood pigeons and hair. Oh. And then incredible military viewing scopes and the sense that at Orford, anything could be tested because it didn't matter. And perhaps the danger of the unexploded is they didn't really mind where things were left yeah. or what they threw in the air to see how it flew, how it destroyed. And it becomes this interesting thing to me that, just as we used to say, throw it away, that Orford became the place where we threw things away. And how on earth do we reconnect to that? Such a brilliant point. Yeah, the idea of a flat landscape is a space where you can do what you want to it. Um, I write a little bit in the book about flat landscapes not being a good victim, right? And I feel a lot of it, I don't know, I, as a person of colour, I feel a sort of sense of affinity with them for this reason. You can do what you want to it, you can throw what you want onto it, and it's just expected to kind of soak it all up. Yeah. And that, that introduced me to that sense um, of, of, of waste, of waste and wastelands. And, and in, in the book, you introduce your own fascinating perspective on, on wasted spaces. Mm. Um, I, I, I think that book, that's a book in itself, I suspect, wasted spaces. Um, and it, it's probably a question that maybe leads us into a mess, um, but, but I, I, I'm going to ask anyway. What do wasted spaces mean to you? So, yeah, it's, um, the idea of waste is really interesting, right? Like, waste, the idea of waste only has meaning within a kind of capitalist framework, I think, that's based on everything having to be useful and useful in a certain kind of way, useful in a legible way. So I'm very interested in spaces that are left waste. And uh, one of the, sp the space I talk about in the book in this regard is, is the Newcastle Town Moor. Now, I don't know if, if any of you know about the Newcastle Town Moor. It's a colossal space. I think it's bigger than Hyde Park, and it's spread in its kind of 
like so much of the city of Newcastle is centered around this green space. And it's sort of in the town's, um, what's the word for it? Like it's sort of um, terms and conditions. That's the wrong word, but we'll go with it. Oh, the bylaws or something. Bylaws, something yeah. like that. Um, that nothing can be built on it. It cannot be turned into a park. Bits of it are developed into a park, bits of it are developed into a golf course, but it, like, it's really difficult to develop it. It's got to stay just this empty green space that everyone can enjoy. You can graze your cow on it, and at different times of year you see cows just in the middle of the city. It's amazing. Um, and pe this has been quite controversial to people, and it kind of elicits mixed feelings. People say, oh, we could do more with that space. We could develop it. We could make it more of a thing. And um, there was a thing in, in, I think, the Newcastle local newspaper, like calling one of Newcastle Moor one of the most like appallingly wasted spaces um, in Britain. And I just thought, I don't think, well, I don't think the concept of waste is useful or interesting here. This is a space that's just doing something different. Um, and it's a really democratic space. So if I used to live in the kind of like noisy, multicultural, um, not, you know, the kind of place where the street cleaners didn't bother to go very often, um, bit of the West End, and you go in to the moor through that entrance, and you go right the way through to the kind of poshest bits, Jesmond and Gosforth. Um, so in that space, there's a sense of it suturing the kind of different parts of the city together and a space where everyone can just be in there to do what they like. You get kind of gangs of young people like just chatting and then you get the sort of um, people sort of in their lycra running, pushing prams. Um, it's great. Um, yeah, there's something about a space which isn't, um, which is wasted, wasted. Which um, to which no kind of um, which isn't put to use in specific ways that I think produces creativity and democracy in ways that I find interesting. That, that, that's the most marvelous thought because that sense of of democracy and access to spaces mm. in every sense the, the the physical and 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 the mental and the actual I guess um, it was brought to a real point particularly during um, the peak years of pandemic of furlough of lockdown of chaos. And it just struck me that in, in lockdown, um, you appear to have most enjoyed meeting people, uh, quite naturally, I suspect, but quite unusually maybe for you. Um, and I wondered if that enjoyment of meeting people was because there was an entire change of pace, mm -hmm. an entire change of focus, of volume. And I just thought the encounters that we had in lockdown were, were different. Yes. In every way imaginable and unpredictable. Um, but the story that you bring of your research into the space, the academic approach to researching this space and looking at satellite views and, and, and LIDAR maps and yeah. so on, and then discovering the huge and mysterious X on the moor mm. is such a good tale, I'm afraid I have to ask you to tell it. Sure. Um, so the diagnosis I tend to work with for myself is, is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. If regular post-traumatic stress disorder straight PTSD has this turning point, complex PTSD describes the kind of flatter plane of kind of ambiguous and ongoing event. Um, and my, one of the, the, the features specifically of complex PTSD is um, finding people very difficult. Um, find, not finding in people a source of safety or comfort or community, but of, of danger and having to work very, very hard to overcome that. So, Normal life is, is a lot. Um, the expectations of you, the social expectations to turn up and be present and laugh is, is very hard. In lockdown, those pressures were lifted. I had the most wonderful lockdown. I was really aware, and it didn't mean that I wasn't incredibly worried about other people. It doesn't mean I hate people. I think people are the most important thing in the world. I really do. Um, but for me personally, it was a time when I was given permission to just be, and I just flourished. I, I, I was very underweight, and I put on weight, so I, um, I became very creative. You know, I'd gone sort of weeks without sort of going into natural spaces, but something about lockdown made me feel like I could go outside. And if I saw people I knew, I could just wave. They wouldn't come over and hug me or touch me in, in ways I wasn't ready to. Um, that was just wonderful, and it gave me, it made me feel more confident, actually, as you say, about just, about being with people, because it was sort of on terms that felt much more tolerable. And yeah, 
um, I lived about six minutes away from the, from the Newcastle Moor at that time. I loved it. And every sort of, so I got into this sort of habit of going out onto the moor and walking around every day. That's my daily walk and meeting people there. And so I became really interested in the moor as a kind of phenomenon. As, and you were talking, you're absolutely right. I got the, um, I got the archaeological report from the city council and did all the things that my academic train teaches me how to do because I'm a lecturer in my, in my other life at the University of Bristol now. Um, yeah, and I went on Google Maps and I saw this mysterious cross. It, when you look at terrain view on Google Maps, the sort of outline in the earth, and I was like, oh my goodness, have I discovered a medieval church? Um, I was very excited. Um, so I went out onto the moor and I found that little cross. Oh, I sort of, I was, I was following Google Maps, you know, because I've got no sense of direction either, which, uh, yeah, always makes me feel a bit of a fraud when it comes to being a nature writer. Um, and I followed the little blue arrow over the moor towards the cross. I was getting closer and closer and closer. And then I saw a man standing with a remote control. And after a while, I realized that there was, he was controlling a, a model airplane in the sky. And I realized that what he was standing on was a cross made of flattened grass. And I stopped and spoke to him. And we had a very strange conversation. It was like, um, you weren't, <laughs> yeah. He was like, I can't, he wanted to talk to me, but he was like, I can't drive, I can't look at the same time. It was like we were talking at this weird cross purposes, but it was a lovely conversation. He told me all about how his club, his you know, model aeroplane club came and sort of made the cross anew every, every so often. And I just thought, what a joy to have been so wrong. <laughs> um, actually, what a joy to have made this hypothesis and then have this person who I didn't know at all bring this massive newness into, into my world, like to teach me something I would never have considered in a hundred years. It was, it's great. Like I get as much pleasure from misreading places as I do from reading them accurately. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful moment, I felt. I, 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 I loved that because I had, I had something very similar. I'm very conscious, I often walk alone. I often look distracted. I often look like I'm not, well, I perhaps don't look like I should be where I am but I'm probably just studying something I've spotted. I, I work at the, the, the Wildlife Trust, and that's opened my eyes to all kinds of things. Um, and in lockdown, you would often meet solitary people. But they started asking me what I was doing in a nice way. They were curious, and then they often shared things. And I, I met someone walking a sheepdog, and I talked about the flowers that were out, and I was going to keep a diary and just, just to, to see what came and what appeared that I'd never really noticed close to home. The things I used to travel to see, I suddenly heard birdsong from my house. Mm. I thought I had to travel 20 miles to here usually each year. And I saw flowers that would make a great fuss of in some places, but don't even notice elsewhere. And the story which shared with me was about a tree where they used to hang people. And I kind of thought, I didn't really want that story, but I'm really glad I know about this strange tree where the sheep rustlers were once hung. And it was a really, really interesting, different way to get into that oral history in a time when we weren't speaking, meeting, socialising, being as close as we are just now, in fact. Um, and I love the story of this, this, this kind of unusual, unusual meeting. Underneath Kendall Castle, some people may be aware, there's... Um, a recycling bunker, and in lockdown we weren't really meant to even throw things away because no one knew what to do about things and who's going to touch it anyway. But next to this historic castle, going back to the wife that outlived Henry VIII, is a tiny grass track where the people with their own controls race cars round and round in circles. And I love the fact that that's between the recycling skips and the castle. Oh, so brilliant. I've, I've, this is my first visit to Kendall, by the way, so I'm, my plan after this is to go and see Kendall Castle. I shall look out for the racing track. I just, I just spotted them, because again, I thought, what are they doing? Stood around and then saw this incredible... Amazing. ...miniature Formula One racing round. So lockdown is a sense of the collective difficulty, misery, challenges, problems, long-lasting and immediate. It struck me that in my closest circle, my, I have one handful of friends, um, and each of them, due to work-related exemptions um, or introversion or the sheer fluke of where we're lucky enough to live, um, or perhaps the nature of having to work, we, we recognise the kind of dubious possibility of lockdown being OK for me. And slowly, we started to admit it to each other that, you know, how are you? Well, I'm all right, actually. I'm quite enjoying my own life, but everything else is horrible, because there's waves of guilt, doubt, discord. Um, so I was really glad and relieved to find in this book that, that that's possible, 
it's possible to have a sense of lockdown joy, no way diminishing or ignoring the harsh cruelties, uh, but coexisting with that cruelty. How did you find joy next to anger? How did that go for you? Yeah. Um, the first thing I think, I, I don't think one should ever feel, I don't, I don't believe in feeling guilt for feelings. I, I believe in, in actions being the thing that are important. Uh, and during lockdown, one of the big things that happened was that I got massively involved with a mutual aid group that was involved and, and still goes on today, like distributing, redistributing food and money from the poorest in the West End of Newcastle to the... So, from the richest to the poorest. God, a terrible reverse Robin Hood. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I was really happy and buoyant, absolutely, um, because finally life was not running against, you know, like, I felt like, I feel all the time a bit like a cat having its fur stroked backwards. And finally, someone was stroking my fur the right way. It was great. Um, and, yeah, I, I felt really, really happy. Um, but, yeah, I did also start to feel angry in a kind of childish way, I guess. Just, this is what, pe this is what people who enjoy the status quo must feel like all the time. Other people are really upset because for the first time maybe in their lives they're having their first stroke the wrong way. And this is the one time when I get it stroked the way that it works for me. Um, because I was, having grown up in the family I did, um, I was used to being confined. You know, I was used to having months going by without leaving the house. To me that was normal. To me that was familiar in a sad way. So it didn't, that didn't trouble me, because it was what I was used to. In a sense, complex PTSD is only a disorder when you're taken out of the traumatic situation that made it necessary, you know? Um, so put back into that box, I was fine. I was flying, flourishing. But yeah, and I also started to notice how, how that inequality worked in terms of, like, I was so lucky, right? I worked from home. As, an, as um, I, was a res I, was doing, I was a researcher at that time, just my whole job was to write an academic book um, so I could do that from home. And uh, so I, had, I was able to work from home. I didn't have kids. Um, I didn't have a garden, but I had the moor that I could go out onto. I wasn't living in the middle of a city like, you know, I had to sort of... Anyway, like other people were having way worse times than me, and people's experience of the pandemic was by and large inflected by their wealth, you know? Uh, their wealth, their privilege, their access, and that made me really angry. Um, and I think that the kind of the sense of radical, productive rage that developed in me during the pandemic has never gone away. Um, and rage in how people were differently policed. I could see it on the moor, in fact. I could see that it was, it was brown and black young men being asked to move along by the police patrolling the moor when other groups weren't. Um, yeah, that anger has never left me. I, I have a wonderful friend, the, often a friend of the festival, uh, Mohammed from Mosaic Outdoors. And Mohammed volunteers with the Yorkshire Dales National Park and the Lake District National Park and um, had, that, had that opportunity to help others um, that he's always been very su subscribed to. Um, and Mohammed said what he spotted was the Yorkshire Dales knew people were coming and enabled that and worked on education and enablement and, and they organized additional parking spaces, more room for everyone, because people were coming. Mm. And my experience in the lakes sent me into a rage because they chose enforcement and signs appeared everywhere, yet there were no resources or people to police them. So you had this very strange thing of signs everywhere of what you don't do, what you shouldn't do, which kind of empowered a weird, flat-capped kind of vigilantism of people who would approach you and say, where are you from? Yes. And I'm, I'm very aware of the irony of me saying this to various people in this room, where are you from? But I was asked it when I was stood with my back to someone and I didn't even look round and said, why would you even ask that question? And when I turned round, a little chap with a flat cap, who I'm gonna call the Sheriff of Sedba, where are you from? <laughs> And I said, over there, where are you from? And he said, over there. And then he stopped and I realized that we were in a complete standoff. Because where's over there? And where are we now? We're neither here nor there. It was just insane. Um, and it was part of the anger, the, the, illogic, the illogical situation of where are we from and where can we go? And, and, and interesting to see on one side of the motorway 
everybody was welcomed. On the other side, we'll see you in a couple of years with your wallets. What do you think informed that difference? I, <clears throat> my personal view um, is vested interest. I think a very small number of people control decisions mm. and some terrible decisions were taken by a very small number of people. And I was fortunate enough to ask um, the chair of the National Park, a farmer in Mallondale, and, and say, thank goodness you did what you did. I couldn't go that far, but I'm really glad you did what you did. And he said, you would not believe the amount of people who said to me, why can't we be more that, like the lakes? But I was always struck that what the lakes did is position an articulated lorry on the south end of the M6 with a sign pointing south to the industrial northwest saying, this is not a car park, this is a national park. And I wondered who that was addressing because that wasn't on the road from the east or the north. It was a very, very targeted campaign to exclude. It made me feel very, very, very unsettled. Me and my mother, row, once a decade. It's not arranged, it's not a deal. I'm kind of happy it's just once a decade. I think it's pretty good going. I think some people row on a daily basis. Um, we've probably got worse as we got older. And I suspect at the age we're at, we've only got one row left in us. Make it a good one. <laughs> Christmas was a doozy. Um, in your book, you go on a trip with your mother. You go to Orkney. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing to read about. And it was a wonderful because of my, my own experience. But to look at yours too. Um, but what was it like for you going to Orkney with your mother? I loved writing that chapter, and I'm glad you liked reading it. Um, so my relationship with my mother, historically, has been complicated. Um, I know that she loves me so, so much, and I love her so much, but it's been very difficult for me to understand some of the decisions that she made when we were growing up, and um, some of the decisions she continued to make after we moved to the UK. Um, and just before I wrote this book, I'd, um, I'd not seen her for three years, partly because of the pandemic, but partly just because it was becoming acutely painful um, and irreconcilable, really. My sense, my sense of the ways in which I had, had been dropped or uncared for when I most needed it, and her decision not to acknowledge that, um, no matter what I said. I felt we were at a real impasse, that before we could move on with our relationship, I you know, didn't need an apology or anything like that. I, I just wanted her to acknowledge that it had happened. Um, so when my mother and I arranged to go to Orkney together to see each other for the first time in those years, I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought, OK, this could be the last time we ever meet. It might be that after this trip, we just say, OK, let's just step away from the relationship for a while. Um, it was extraordinary. Um, it was a trip full of, like, tension and grumpiness on my part and irritability and but something happened there that worked something happened in those flat spaces of Orkney that that worked and having that trip with my mother and writing about it and then having her accept what I had written about it and acknowledge start to acknowledge some of the truth of, of what had happened it has transformed our relationship. And I think there is something about the broad stretches of a flat landscape that enables that. In that landscape, without the kind of, because mountains and rivers, they steer you, don't they? In a totally flat landscape, with that sense that you can move any way you like, I do think, ideally, there becomes a possibility to tell new kinds of story and kind of form new kinds of relationship with each other. And I didn't know that before I went to Orkney, but it's what happened, yeah. Thank you for that, Noreen. I'm minded that one of the things my mum's asked me to do is to take her somewhere where she will hear Skylark. Oh. And Skylark are a bird often of the flat places. Yes, you should go to the Somerset places. levels. Absolutely. Great Skylark. Oh, the low flat levels, even better. And it struck me that <clears throat> that's the thing we need to do. Yeah. That's the thing we need to do, me and mum. Now, I started thinking whilst reading that whilst yeah, um, you might generally uh, be un unsure how you feel, or, or indeed how to feel mm. at times, that you were gradually revealing um, what I found to be a very, very high level of, of awareness and a deep understanding of self. You clearly spent a great deal of energy and time um, working things through and continuing to do so. Um, this is evident, really, I think, in the conversation today. And 
I wonder if you can say anything to that in, in the time and what you've learnt about yourself mm. and, 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 and what you're still perhaps trying to address. Yeah, oh God, such a good question. Um, from lockdown, I definitely learned that, <coughs> that I could connect with people. It was just important to kind of, to know that I could, I guess, ask for what I needed and do it on my terms and that, that I needed a lot of being alone and I couldn't just... I'd always thought I just need to power through it. I just need to like get on with it and stop making a fuss. And, and that actually doesn't work. Maybe it works for some people, it didn't work for me. And, but I can be a better, a better friend, a better daughter, a better everything if I'm able to have something of what I need in, in life as well. Um, I think I... I think the biggest thing that I take away from it is a. Uh, I'm interested in the way flat landscapes promise us that they will tell us everything, right? Everything is laid out in a flat landscape. There's nothing you can't see. It's all there. <coughs> and yet, there's a sense of something hidden as well in a flat landscape, I think. And our instincts in this world, maybe with each other, maybe with the past, is that we think that we need to know everything. We need to dig and find things out. But actually, one of the things I learned with my mother that was that to be close to her, I didn't need to know everything about her. I didn't need her to think of herself the same way I thought about her. We didn't need to agree on everything. That actually, the most powerful thing was to leave some things about her unknown. Things she didn't want to be known, I wouldn't know. And that seems weird, right? That seems counterintuitive. We think that to know someone and to be intimate, there must be mutual knowledge. But actually, oh, actually I think there's a special kind of intimacy that can come with allowing people to be private, allowing there to be this flat space in which you can get no kind of purchase, you know? And I think there's something very powerful in making a decision to not try and get... Because I think that when we think we need to know people fully, there's a way in which that's trying to get power over them in a weird way. I think that it can be quite... When we're faced with someone we don't understand or don't know, we can feel quite powerless. And actually, I think we need to maybe sit with that powerlessness and tolerate it. Because I think that lets us do some quite important caring for each other. I think a lot about how different people are in this world and how there are some experiences I will never understand and can never understand. The big example for me as a cis woman is I will never understand what it is to be trans. I will never understand what, it, what people mean when they say that they were born in the wrong body. All I can do, my responsibility is to say, I can't understand you, I don't know, but you tell me this is what it's like, you tell me this is what you need, I'll help you get that. Yeah. So it's a way, I think, of fully fulfilling our responsibility to other people, to have compassion even, perhaps especially where we can't understand. Because otherwise, if we, if we assume that we need to... Under empathy is interesting, right? We think of empathy as like clearly a good thing. But there's, there becomes a complication, we say, in order to help you, I need to imagine, I need to be able to imagine what it's like to be you. Sometimes you can't imagine what it's like to be someone, but you still have to be good to them. So I think that's the biggest thing. Flat, this whole process of writing the book gave me confidence that ethically, we have this great responsibility to each other, and it's one based on not knowing as much as knowing. Told you, didn't I? <laughs> um, when I came to prepare my notes for today, I've, it just fell out of the book. Actually, this is the work that goes into these events. Um, two things stood out from my scribbled notes, and one was a line in quotes which said, "Not laid bare, but laid open," mm. with a footnote in brackets. Are these my words or Noreen's? They're very good. <laughs> yours. Oh. They are very good. <laughs> it was a 50-50. I'm sorry. Um, that's how it made me feel. Not, not laid bare, but laid open. Um, the other was a page number next to a blasphemous expletive. That's definitely mine, which I'm not going to repeat on a Sunday morning. Um, but what I would love is another reading from Noreen. And I would wish, uh, I'd love for you to read page 202, um, starting with my life in Pakistan. Yeah. To, to, 205, please, Noreen, if you would. Of course. Um, to where it stopped. But my life in Pakistan on, on 202. Um, get ready, guys. It's quite an, quite an introduction. Um, my life in Pakistan, I think now, was like a bare field with nothing to strive towards or hope for, 
and the wind blowing hard straight across that flat space. My years in Pakistan will haunt me all my life. I move my life over its stretches in small circles and large ones. But Pakistan isn't the flat place. One is often misread. One is especially often misread if one is a woman of color. So the flat place is not Pakistan. Pakistan is not the place of trauma, of lack, of pain. The flat place is what happens when one's reality is at odds with that of everyone else, when one's truth comes starkly into contact with a world which denies it, which cannot see it. Pakistan was the real part of my life. When I boil my life right down, what crystallizes around the edges and flakes off is Pakistan. That was where the things happen which British people don't want to think about. The gardener who was tortured by the police, big blocks of wood dug into his calf muscles at the corners till he screamed. The children picking through the rubbish heaps, children with polio, children with missing limbs, children with burns over half their faces, leaving one wide forever open eye. Children who are much, much worse off than I would ever be. This violent, hateful world is in, as real in Britain as it is in Pakistan. It happens in Britain right now, as well as in the places Britain left in pieces when it had finished playing out its imperial fantasies. But Britain still won't let itself know that. When it was an empire, Britain shipped its shit abroad to its colonies in a very literal sense. It forcibly exported its cheap, crude cotton fabric to India, for instance, destroying South Asian industries for English profit. In fact, it still sends its rubbish abroad, its tainted recycling, its piles of landfill, to become the problem of other countries which don't contain white people and which therefore seem to matter less. But also, it exported its psychological shit, its hang-ups, its hatreds, its moral panics. It was under the British Raj that homosexuality was codified as a criminal offence. Now Britain, supposedly progressive, looks back at homophobia and its ex-colonies and tuts disapprovingly. In fact, the very existence of Pakistan, riven as it is now by religious anxiety, intolerance and rigidity, derived from the philosophies the empire brought with it. Britain's divide and rule policy whipped up tensions between Hindus and Muslims until it seemed to some that the only way for Muslims in the subcontinent to survive was to have their own state. The Raj effectively imagined the country and its central premise into existence until Pakistan ejected itself by force from the empire in pain and crisis. And then when Cyril Radcliffe had drawn his sloppy line down the subcontinent in 1947, and when the fallout from this division was violence, rape, and murder, Britain refused to hear it. Mountbatten, the last British Viceroy of India, defended the death toll prudishly as, in 1962 as not more than 250,000 dead. And this is a low number. It could have been anything up to 5 million. We do not know, precisely because Britain couldn't be bothered to know. It was too busy hoisting itself out of the country after almost 100 years of direct rule, preoccupied with world wars that had turned out more expensive than planned. The West makes a strange demand of the East, that non-white people should somehow be untraumatized by things which would leave a white person reeling, that because those things are normal there, a horrifying normal, in this case, grown out of a bungled withdrawal from a violent empire. They somehow leave no impact on the people who go through them. Like my grandmother, who endured partition. Like my father, who at 17 fought in the Civil War. They never talked about either experience. Why would you speak if you don't trust anyone to listen or care? Britain sent its shit to Pakistan, and in Pakistan it settled and stayed. Lahore had no waste disposal system. There were no drains in the roads, but at least you could see it. Nothing was hidden. Not the rubbish, not the electricity pylons which barred the city skies. When I came to Britain, Pakistan was still real. It was still the real thing. It was just that no one around me could see it. The things I'd seen and lived through were still going on, worse and worse, and in Britain too. Poverty and racism and sexism. I arrived in Britain in 2005. Raunch culture was at its height. I was stunned to see Playboy bunnies printed on children's pencil cases in the shops. 
No one seemed to notice how bad things were for women in this supposedly liberated country. In Pakistan, we talked about women's rights. We called ourselves feminists. Here, in 2005, the response was a shrug. Feminism was over, right? The bad things were right in front of me, and no one was talking about them. On the TV in Little Britain, David Walliams blacked up and everybody laughed. On the streets, homeless people hunched on the pavements. And British people strode by as though this was normal in one of the wealthiest of all countries. Now, living in the UK, I do know that the world around me is real. That Britain, with clean water coming straight out of the taps, and people laughing in the pub after work, and fish fingers in the freezer, and advertisements on the TV, is real. But Pakistan stored a wordless knowledge inside me, a sure, horrifying, beautiful certainty, which is wholly at odds with the world I live in a reality that Britain can't absorb. And I don't want to stop feeling the way I do. I don't want to give up knowing in this very visceral way what I know about people and what they can do to you. Countries and what they can do to you. I don't ever want to be wholly relaxed, wholly at home, in a world of flowing fresh water built on the parched pain of others. The world itches, and so it should when there is a truth which affirms itself insistently in a way that has no end and no resolution, when it receives no responsiveness or recognition and has nowhere to cite itself but in itself, entrenched in its own starkness, that's the flat place. Cassandra screaming was in the flat place. Or rather, she entered it when the screaming finally stopped. The world itches and so it should, is what made me write what I did. We've got a few minutes left and we will open to questions in a moment, but just before we do as a final thought, an af not an afterthought, food for thought, in the very back of the book there's um, an addendum around some words in the book and one of the words I'd just like to touch on is, is friends and, and you talk about when talking to friends and, and how, what friends are to you. Yeah. And I wonder if, if there's a concise, here's a challenge, a concise way to explain <laughs> friends. Lovely. My relationships will never be normal with other people. I don't think I'm ever going to find, well, for me, it would be a wife and, and settle down in monogamous joy forever. For me, I think my relationships are always going to be networks of friends. And friend is a word that in both the West and the East envelops many kinds of intimacy, some sexual, some romantic, some not. Um, and I think that, that that expansive sense of a friend is, is really important and beautiful. And I think we're moving towards, in, at this time, a, a new kind of valuing of friendship in all the forms that it takes. Yeah. And I, think, and I dedicate this book to my friends. Thank, thank you, Noreen. So today we'll part, hopefully, as friends. I would like you to make a friend of this wonderful <laughs> book. If I'd been hooked up to an oscilloscope for this session, I was definitely not flatlining. I don't know how it's felt to be you, or <laughs> how it feels to be you. Um, I think we just have to enjoy the flat line sometime. So if we could lift the lights and just take a few minutes for any questions from the audience, please. I may repeat the question back because it can be hard for people to hear across the room. Um, any questions for Noreen, please? Yes, at the front. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your creative process. Mm. Um, what was it like for you to collect material for the book? How do you balance being embodied in places and being disembodied in places yeah. with your mental health perspective? Marvellous question about the creative process when you feel embodied and part of or disembodied of place. Uh, please, Noreen. It's a great question. Thank you for that. I think that it comes back to, I, I suppose what I said earlier, that not feeling any guilt for anything that you do feel, not feeling that anything you feel or don't feel is a problem. The chapter on orphanness is quite a lot of me just tracking how disembodied I did feel, you know? And part of it is, if you feel disembodied, write about feeling disembodied. And then give yourself permission to move. For me, it was about, give, sorry, I shouldn't tell you what to do, but I just mean, for me, it was about giving myself permission to, to move between those states to stay disembodied if I needed to be, to re-embody if I needed to be. Um, 
And actually, I think something about giving myself that permission allowed me to be more powerfully embodied when I was. Um, noticing, it was about noticing and accepting myself in whatever state I was in. And, that, and I think that is part of that whole process about how pressured we can feel to only focus on certain things, right? Again, the mountain rather than the flat. If you focus on whatever you are called upon to focus on, um, it sounds sort of very evangelical of me, but um, I think something good comes of that. And notice things you feel, notice what you notice. I have a policy, I don't keep a diary, but I take a photograph of anything in my life that I look at more than once because I feel that those are trying to tell me something important. And it's amazing, yeah. I, how, I, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question at all, but just, yeah, thank you for that, yeah. For, for, she had, we shared photos, didn't we, just as we yes. started? And, <laughs> and it's a, it's a, great, a great diarising of, of, of time and space, um, the quick phone photo. Um, any more questions, please? Uh, yes, uh, the gentleman here. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much, you were very inspiring. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, the reason you guys, would I be right in saying that you like the flat space because you're in charge? You're standing above it, unlike your past that you were not in charge of your own life. Mm -hmm. Would I be like right to think of that, or is it some other reason behind it? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, so the, the sense of, uh, for, for the rest of the room, um, the sense of, of is being happy in a flat place about being in charge of a flat place? Yeah. It's a great question, and I think that must be part of it. That sense, particularly, that I could go in any direction. Yeah, that I could do anything I want, but I could also do nothing because there's no dramatic scenery I have to pay attention to in the right way. So absolutely, that sense of having some kind of control over myself and my own perceptions, but also lots of other things, right? Um, like part of it is also feeling that the way I feel inside this kind of flat space with nothing to look at gets mirrored by the landscape around me. Um, and also, I mean, so much, right? The tiny joys as well as the big ones. Feeling immersed in sky, like being immersed in water, but back to front. Um, but yeah, absolutely, that sense of not being controlled or steered by somebody else, or somebody else's priorities, somebody else's sense of what the right things to look at, to look at the right things and not look at the wrong things. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> any, any more questions, anyone? Um, uh, in the second row there with the hat on, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm really interested about this idea of um, open and sort of hidden. Mm. Because one of the reasons I love walking in flat places, for instance, is that I find them quite private. I'm not yeah. looked at. If I'm in a hilly night, I feel like people are looking at me from there. How interesting, yeah. I'm up the hill, yeah. people can see me from below. But I was just wondering, you know, and that feels quite comforting to me, but I, don't, I was wondering, is that just because I, I was wondering to get your reflections as like a, you know, a, a woman walking in yeah. space. Privacy for me is a comforting thing. Mm. But actually, is that the same if you're sort of woman walking in spaces or not? Oh, know. yes. Well, I, I don't, I think this is the thing. I, I've had a very strange life and I think I, might, I must project quite a strange vibe. I think, I don't know if it's the queerness that people pick up on in me, um, but of all the terrible things that have happened to me, I, I very seldom feel sexualized walking in public places and I'm very very grateful for that I'm weird or maybe I am and I'm just totally oblivious to it that that might be it as well like I'm and this sounds I care about people more than anything else and people being okay what I don't care about is what people think of me um I it seems to me to be their own business um and so I can really forget to worry about that I don't like people I don't like feeling surveilled I hate it um, because that, yeah, I do feel unsafe in a kind of general way. Just the idea of being looked at prevents you from just being, you know? Um, but yeah, you're right. Like, I have massive, I, I experience massive privilege in those places because I don't have to worry about my own safety. Oh, I don't, maybe I should worry, but I don't worry about my own safety. And I love places where there's no one. And in a flat landscape, you can see people coming for miles off. So <laughs> in that sense, it's very safe. Con Thank you. Conscious of some of the things Noreen expresses, when I spoke to her before the event, I said, is, is there anything we can do to accommodate this event more comfortably? And, and Noreen said, nothing frightens me. It's already happened. I've lived through it. So there we are. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between. We're so pleased everyone feels welcome, hopefully, here at Kendall Book Festival in Kendall Mountain.
there will be now the, the, the book signing towards the back of the room and a chance perhaps to speak to, to Noreen there as well. I hope you've enjoyed the session. I truly have. Thank you to the, the Brewery Arts Centre, the technical crew who were here latest last night, earliest this morning, the support of Cotswolds Outdoors, and most of all, thank you, Noreen, for showing us a flat place. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for coming.